feels feels a little civil worry. People might say I, I'm, I'm a little alarmist when I mention a potential civil war, right? I was in Egypt during the second revolution. You could look down and you could see Tahrir Square, people screaming, laser pointers, helicopters, Apaches, and they announce in the news, we've, de we've deposed the president two blocks away, a dude's eating a cheeseburger at McDonald's watching a football match as if nothing's happening. It starts to feel like there's some kind of political violence that is bubbling up that can't be mended at this point. I've been predicting America will have a civil war or revolution since 2020. Back then, this sort of thing appeared distant, like something you would read about in a history book. The scary thing is that now it's real. Is America headed for another civil war? The George Floyd riots that burn cities throughout the nation, along with the rise of patriot militias surging to record numbers, has a number of pundits saying just that. The United States is indeed on the precipice of civil war. A recent poll found that a significant number of both Republicans and Democrats believe that violence is a justifiable response to their political opponents. And another poll found that a majority of Republicans, 53%, believe that our nation is indeed headed toward another civil war. The most intense form of conflict is war. That's the real conflict. That's real consequences. I can't figure out and uh, the route out of where we are. So what's the navigable route out of that? I just don't remember a time where the country's been so divided, left versus right, and there's very little gray area. It's as if there's only two choices. Yes. You're either left or right. The deep fake thing combined with one other technique that is easily available to the public I guarantee 100% would result in a civil war happening tomorrow. The civil wars are felt by everyone felt in the nation. It, they're felt brutally by but everyone the, in the, the nation. The, 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 the Texas has 29.53 million people, 15 million Republicans. What would happen if 1% of Republicans in Texas said, Governor Abbott, tell us where to stand. The federal government is impotent and powerless and can do nothing. There's but, no amount of military force the feds would be able to bring in to control that. There's no F-16s. There's no nuclear bombs. They can make every argument they want. But there's a reason why we could not win in Afghanistan and Vietnam. There's a reason why we we only got an armistice in Korea. Large groups of people with guns are the, the principal force of any of any armed faction. Joe Biden's like, you can't go up against us because we got F-16s. He said it again recently. Sorry, bro. One hundred and fifty thousand people in one area. You can't like your bombs will not stop that. And further, anyone who knows pol uh, war strategy, psy psyops, etc., knows if the Biden administration took up active conflict against one hundred and fifty thousand people, you would ignite a civil war overnight. Hello, my fellow civil warriors. Welcome to Mokadon is right. I am Mokadon. And today we are talking about civil war. Civil war is a subject that's been coming up a lot. And so I want to express my opinion of it, and I want you to think about it seriously. And I want to then give you a fairly lengthy clip of Rudger over at uh, What If Alt Hist. And that's a channel I really like because while he's a young guy, he's essentially an internet historian, and he does a very good job, I think, of analyzing as much of the facts that we can analyze. The truth is, the Civil War would be a horrible, devastating thing. It would completely destroy the U.S. economy, leaving all of us poor. A number of people would starve to death. If you uh, extrapolate the number of people died who died in the first Civil War with the population we have today, you would have over 6 million deaths in a Civil War today. There's no way to know if that's what's going to happen. It's entirely possible that we would have a civil war that would amount to nothing. It's also entirely possible that we would have a civil war that would go on for decades. So with the, with the, the, the vagaries that exist, we have to sort of narrow it down to the likely scenarios. And I have a very specific opinion about what the likely scenario is. I believe there are two likely scenarios. One of them is that under a right wing, or we'll call it left right, it's not really that simple, but for the sake of simplicity in this talk, we'll call it left and right. 
with a right-wing president, say Donald Trump, the left, certain states, California, maybe Oregon, maybe Washington, they decide they want to secede from the union. If that happens, it'll be a very short civil war. There is no Republican president, and I don't believe any Democrat president either, that is going to tolerate any secession from the United States. I think they'll all put on their inner Lincoln and go to war. And that's going to be a really short war. The left is ill-prepared. The states that are left-wing blue states are actually left-wing blue cities completely surrounded by red armed people. More than two-thirds of the guns are in the hands of the right. More than two-thirds of the military supports the right. And I do believe whatever side the military or the majority of the military sides with would be the side that would probably prevail. So I don't really I don't really see the left being able to really wage a civil war with the right in power. If the left is in power, if an, you know, if, the, if an election is stolen and the right feels disenfranchised or if the left is just in power legitimately but the right is a 40 or 45% minority and they feel disenfranchised because of that, there's a very good chance, I think an exceptionally good chance that the right would would rebel. This would not be a rebellion of secession. This would be a rebellion to conquer and reinstate the Constitution because the United States is not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. And if the left, in order to have their way, socialism, communism, redistribution of wealth, confiscation of firearms, censorship, in, in order for the left to have their way, they have to do away with the Constitution. The U.S. military is sworn to uphold the Constitution. The U.S. military is overwhelmingly on the right. The guns are overwhelmingly in the hands of the right. All of the food and, and most of the manufacturing happens in areas controlled by the right. Every transportation system that supplies electricity, water, anything into the major blue cities goes through areas on the right where they can be blown up, blockaded, whatever. I don't personally see in that situation, even with the left in charge of the government, I don't see the left stands much of a chance. And there's a lot of people who agree with me. Again, Rudger over at What If Alt Hist, a fantastic YouTube channel. I highly recommend. He He's going to lay it out for us, but... I largely think we're going to have a more traditional civil war. And I don't know when that's going to happen. Probably not going to happen while I'm young enough to fight because I'm pretty much at the end of that time frame now. I mean, I have all the stuff to fight, can equip a five-man combat team. And maybe I will, in a civil war, equip a five-man combat team with my weapons. But the fact of the matter is, we're just not, uh, we're not there yet. The left is ill-prepared. They're not going to start it. The right is well-prepared, but they, uh, they lack the leadership and command and control. And I think that's going to come from governors. I think we're going to have a very traditional civil war. The nation's already bifurcating very much into right-left to where the right controls you know, 95% of the physical, geographical country the left controls the, the major cities. The left is dominant in terms of population, but they become islands, easily concentrated populations, easily attacked, easily cut off from food, easily cut off from water, easily cut off from supply routes. The right is dispersed throughout large rural areas extremely difficult to attack the rights command and control, which would develop. So I think it's going to be red states, and there's, I think we're up to 28 now, if my count is right, 28, that allow you to carry a handgun in your pocket without a permit anywhere you go, pretty much. There's probably going to be about 30 states that are on the right. 
I think 25 states said they supported Texas in their border issues. So somewhere between 25 and 30 states with roughly 40% of the population is going to be on the right. It's not going to be a civil war of secession. It's going to be a civil war to conquer the government, put them back, essentially a constitutional retrenchment. That's how I see it. You can feel free to disagree in the comments. By the way, please like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe is a big one. We're a young channel. We need your help. Please subscribe. So let's talk about uh, how that civil war is going to happen. Well, the country's already bifurcating geographically. Red states are becoming redder. Blue states uh, tend to become bluer. The weapons are on the right. The food is on the right. The water's on the right. The administration of this country currently is on the left. If Donald Trump is elected president, and I think he will be, and I hope he will be, you're not going to see a civil war because the left cannot mount a civil war with a right-wing president because a right-wing president is going to be able to maintain control of the military and, and quickly dispatch the problem. You're, you're going to have a civil war that relates to a left-wing presidency where the right decides we're not going along with this and there's enough obvious corruption that, you know, half the, half the country supports the right half. Let's just say half the country supports the left half. The military is going to bifurcate. Massive amounts of the military are going to go with the right states, led by a governor, I think. And we will topple the government, and the government will fall completely, and there will be new elections. Well, two possibilities. There'll be new elections with maybe the Democrat Party being banned. That's possible. The Nazi Party was banned in Germany. Or maybe there'll be no elections, and for a decade or two we'll have a right-wing military dictatorship, but I think a fairly benevolent one. Uh, which would eventually result in us returning to some form of Republican democracy. It just may take a decade for them to sort out the Constitution, make a few tweaks here and there, get that through the process like happened in the last Civil War where we, where we got the, I think it's the 12th, 13th, and 14th Amendments. And we're going to have a return to normalcy after a while, but this will devastate the country economically. That's how I see it. I essentially see left and right. There, there, there may be factions, more factions than that. Could be 10 factions. But I think you're going to primarily be looking at a left-right divide. The right factions will align with each other and argue over the details after they're victorious. The left factions will align with each other and argue over the details as they become dead. And that's how I see it. Now, we have a movie uh, coming out in April. I'm looking forward to it. It's, you know, Civil War for America. It, it, it lays out a, uh, a fictional view of what might happen. But it actually makes a little bit of sense. You can't tell how it would break down, but it gives you an idea of, of what it looks like to some extent. It gives you an idea that a lot of the country will not be affected by the Civil War. I think it also, uh, even though the Civil War will be in a lot of places, you know, you can be 10 minutes away from where the war is being fought and lead a relatively normal life, unless you're in an urban area that's been locked down. Uh, you know, if you're in Manhattan and there's a Civil War in Rochester, New York, um, and the right is winning overthrowing the left-wing New York government, you're not going to have electricity, you're not going to have water, you're not going to have food. You're going to surrender because you're not brain dead. And then things for you will return to normal. Let's, take, let's listen to the trailer. I think it's a great trailer. It's well worth your time. Let's, let's see the Civil War trailer, and then I'll be back. Citizens of America. People of the Florida Alliance. You gotta move! 
expand the Western forces of Texas and California. We'll be welcome back to these United States as soon as their illegal secessionist government is deposed. You don't know what side they're fighting for. Someone's trying to kill us. We are trying to kill them. Okay, Mocha Dunn is right back after that trailer for the Civil War movie coming out in April, and I'm looking forward to it. You know, I mean, it's a fantasy. Anybody who says they know what's going to happen, they don't. We, we're just guessing. I thought it was an interesting movie because I think we're in a point now, and a lot of other people agree, where Civil War is a possibility for the United States, but the United States also could go through the next eight or 12 years without a civil war because we have uh, Donald Trump followed by two years of another Republican president. We don't have the craziness on the left. We could have a civil war that results from an economic collapse. The economic collapse is possible because of our national debt. Uh, We could have a civil war that results in a a left-wing presidency, which uh, as the debt becomes a problem and the dollar collapses, they don't deal with that very well. And uh, they do some things, confiscate property, you know, Venezuela style communist stuff that's unconstitutional. The right would rise up against that. Uh, it could, we could have a civil war over gun control where again, you have to have a left wing administration that doesn't believe in the constitution, which they clearly don't. And they decide to confiscate guns and boom, instant civil war. You could have a civil war over the border We're very close to that now where a bunch of states, you know, the say the Supreme Court says, nope, left wing administration can do whatever it wants on the border. Let's say we don't have an an election upcoming, say Biden gets reelected and says, now we're just going to keep flooding in illegals. Well, you have a civil war over that. A lot of states, a lot of red states could band together very quickly. And in in a modern civil war with states as the powers, both sides are going to be nuclear powers. Almost instantly, the state of Texas can, in fact, be a nuclear power. Uh, North and South Dakota and Wyoming, where the nuclear missiles are, those silos could be taken over by the governors of North and South Dakota and um, governor of Wyoming, and you could have a, a complete... Uh, nuclear standoff. That's a possibility. So I don't know, but I am going with what Rudyard says over at What If Alt Hist. Again, highly recommend his channel. Recommend Tim Pool's channel as well, uh, Timcast. But Rudyard has laid it out. I'm going to play that video for you. Again, please like, comment, and subscribe. This is a bit of a long clip. Stick with it. It lays it all out. He's more articulate than I am. I've looked at a lot of this stuff, and I agree with his analysis. So let's go to that clip. Like, comment, subscribe. Hang on. There are a couple factors that historically determine who wins civil wars with almost ironclad certainty. I'm going to go through these here as a brief way to determine who would win in any possible coming conflict. The first factor, and by a truly massive factor that's impossible to overstate, is the military. In civil wars in which a nation has a professional, good quality military, the side that the army goes with will predict who will win the civil war with frightening accuracy. This is because the difference between trained and untrained soldiers in combat is so massive that if one side can train its soldiers, it cannot lose. The U.S. military has historically always tilted right. 
There aren't good statistics for the last 10 years, but I see very little evidence that things would change. It hasn't been a completely massive tilt historically, but something to consider is that as the left grows more radical, it becomes more anti-military and against the values that hold the military together, like honor, discipline, and duty. Meanwhile, the right, as it becomes more radical, becomes more markedly militaristic and pro-military. Thus, in a process of radicalization, as will almost certainly happen, we'd expect the army to fall into a more right-wing sphere. Officers or those who'd provide leadership and make the decisions for what political side their units would choose tilt significantly more conservative as well, more so than the rest of the military. For the most part, the military would go right, with an exception being national guards of left-wing states like California or New York. However, even in this case, conservative states tend to have larger national guards than progressive ones. The second factor being control of resources, notably the necessary ones like food, energy, and the like. In short terms, if a side can control these, it can just shut off the power and food to starve out its opponents, destroying even the ability to stand up straight, let alone wage war. Here the right has a very strong advantage. When you strip away all factors, the political division in America is that between city and countryside, and the countryside produces literally everything the cities consume, whether food, oil, electricity, in many cases water and the like. Since all rural areas in America are conservative, it's incredibly easy to see them just surround and blockade cities, cutting them off from any resources. Even on a broader geographic level, the conservative states are a giant central block while the blue states are on either side of the continent. The blue bubbles in between like Chicago, Minneapolis, New Mexico, or Colorado are surrounded on all sides by hundreds of miles of red territory that would almost certainly immediately consume them. I think this is probably one of the biggest factors, where the right is a single geographic entity encompassing the vast majority of the country. Meanwhile, the left controls various islands of territory, as well as territory on each coast, but even those long coastal strips are remarkably easy to divide, split up, and keep them from coordinating. So you'd have a central right-wing command in all likelihood, while the various left-wing ones would be split between a New York command, a Boston command, a Washington DC command, a San Francisco command, a Seattle command, that would make it incredibly difficult for the left to coordinate while the right could just surround and consume them. The third factor is culture, or what side can muster a tough group of fighting men who will fight fanatically for their cause. In the Russian Civil War, the Bolsheviks started out with something like 2% of the support of the population, but they were able to maintain the most internal unity among their coalition, literally shooting any dissenters, thus resulting in the chaos that came with the fall of Tsarist society. John Haidt did a series of studies in his wonderful book The Righteous Mind about how almost all cultures follow six values in their ideologies, whether harm, liberty, fairness, purity, loyalty, or authority. The first three are dividing values, which basically split apart society to the benefit of the individual, and the latter three are unifying values, which weaken the individual for the group's benefit. Most societies in history are very high in unifying values and low in dividing, either since they were under the rule of cruel autocracies, who crushed the individual, or their societies were obsessed with survival of the group with little value attached to the individual. This is the way societies in Africa and Asia often are, being very collectivist. The Western right tends to be pretty balanced between unifying and dividing values. Meanwhile, you see the Western left being extremely high in value harm, and to lesser degrees liberty and fairness. You'll hear right-wingers pull on values like honor, courage, loyalty to nation, and respect for authority that you just don't see left-wingers pull on. The bourgeois Western left has a really poor track record of keeping together coalitions because they just don't have the values to glue together unity. The communists are an exception, but strangely enough, they'd be classified as social conservatives today. Communist countries were very patriarchal, banned abortion and homosexuality, and demanded their populations follow their inherited values while praising courage, discipline, and manliness. Meanwhile, the modern American left is incapable of holding a coalition or army together since they view any standards or hierarchies as oppressive. The idea of social justice warriors coordinating an army to wage war is so laughable, even left-wingers can make comedy skits about it. Just look at Chaz or the Seattle Secession Estate that ran out of food within 16 hours of starting and within a day devolved into a dictatorship run by a SoundCloud rapper. Something else to consider is to look at how the left continually eats its own factions in radicalism while the right just does not. And you can see this today where the left does cancel culture, where it just continually eats the members who aren't pure enough of its own faction. And you see that across history where the left would continually split into Marxist, Leninists, Trotskyites, anarchists who could not get along and would have civil wars amongst themselves, and you just do not see that in the right. You do not see right-wingers turn on their own people. 
Left-wing militaries of all sorts underperform militarily. Just compare how the Soviet Union went through ideological purges before World War I, with ideological infighting being the norm in the left and purging its own population. Meanwhile, fascist Japan or Germany did not purge their own populations, but instead turned their hatred at other groups and fought terrifyingly well for nations their size. Across history, unless there's a significant technological or administrative difference, the rural side in a conflict will always beat the urban one. Connected to the first point, the right has a much more martial culture. I once heard a joke on a left-wing late-night TV show that one side in America brings guns into battle and the other brings replica katanas. One cannot be a hunter in the modern left. The modern left literally views masculinity and aggression as toxic and can be removed from society. For those that don't read history, societies that martial warrior cultures lose and get conquered. When you get down to it, the sides that win wars are those that can convince young men to fight hardest for them. As the left gets more radical, it will alienate young men, and very much more so young men of good military fiber, who will go to the right. Young men are insecure and trying to find their way in the world, and so feminism's emphasis on toxic masculinity will breed a horrifying counter-reaction, about which I will make a future video. This YouTube channel's viewership is over 90% young men, and so tell me this. If you're picking what side you will fight and die for, will a speech on how we need to empower genderqueer people of color inspire you, or would you prefer to hear one on how you will fight for honor and God and country? How you will be heroes and burn your enemies out of their holes, forward to glory for king until your last dying breath? Between military resources, centralized geography, and culture, I think we've covered the really important variables. However, the left still has some advantages. The major centers of technology, culture, and capital are in left-wing hands. However, I largely think that these are non-factors. As Mao Zedong said, power comes from the barrel of a gun and the left-wingers can have Hollywood, the banks, and Apple. But if those people don't have the missiles or the electricity, they can't fight. I often hear people say that the left has some massive financial or technological advantage that would give them victory. The real technological difference in red and blue states is nil, and the economic and population size of both is the same. The left would be physically incapable of hiring mercenaries to be able to match the U.S. military, and the top American mercenary companies would probably end up siding with the right anyway. Likewise, the division among young people was likely smaller than people would think, and as said before, the right would have a much stronger pull on the young demographic that matters for civil wars. I just kept young. on being confused on how this could possibly be a civil war. When it comes to actual military punching ability, one side has so much more power than the other that it almost seems like a joke. How could we have gotten to the point where it looks like we're on the verge of a civil war between two sides that are so fundamentally mismatched? The external pressures of survival, and with their view of history as a permanent arc of progress, left-wingers don't have the intellectual ability to think critically about being crushed by the right in a conflict. This is why they push for various extremist measures, because the idea that they could just lose and die and the arc of history loses is just impossible for them. The left pulls a revolution now. The right just pulls out the army and pulls out the electricity and crushes them. Since the left believes that progress is a continuous upwards trajectory, when they push for things, no matter how radical they imagine they must succeed, even if real terms, they're just walking into a slaughter. We have a civil war between the right and the left. The right will just win. It's a matter of how long it takes, and I see two different kinds of scenarios that could play out. The first scenario is a slow burn, in which, say for whatever reason, left-wing militias seize control over the inner cities and establish their own societies. Again, for whatever reason, whether lack of political will, bad timing, or a left-wing presidency, the right does not crack down upon them. We now see a conflict between the right and left-wing militias, fought in gang violence in American cities, as we see mass depopulation of the countryside. Meanwhile, the far right gets more influence over the army and in rural areas. America becomes slowly shittier in this world. The country becomes poorer and supply chains can't keep up. In the best case scenario, and probably most likely, radical leftists gradually make a fool of themselves and lose all electoral power. After several years, a populist right-wing president ceases power and brings the nation to a new positive direction. This scenario is a lot to say for it in my opinion, given that the U.S. is a lot less desperate than other similar eras of history, since no one will starve in America, and Americans any pretty moderate people politically, as the historical record shows as well. The more radical scenario is that the left goes more radical more quickly. The U.S. Army feels threatened and then launches what amounts to a coup, cleaning and killing left-wing cities, restructuring societies so the left cannot have power again. This kind of scenario is more plausible than you might imagine given how America is becoming so politically radicalized that it's entirely possible blood will come. In some ways, it seems like the more likely option. 
Americans are becoming so unhinged, I don't know by what kinds of peaceful methods they could calm down. On top of this, there's a massive precedent for this sort of thing when unhinged urban leftists cause revolutions only to have the army immediately crush them. Look at France, Germany, Spain, Indonesia, Argentina, Hungary, Chile, and the like. The norm, which might be different given how strong America's institutions are, is that the army kills large numbers of the leftist elite and the rest go quiet. The nation then becomes a conservative military dictatorship for a decade on average, before switching back to democracy. Something to consider is that the military is by far the most loved and respected institution in America at 80% support, compared to Congress, the universities, and the media, which are all at 20%. And that makes a military dictatorship more plausible than you could probably imagine. An important fact to consider is that the more developed a country is, the more likely it is to go to right-wing totalitarianism and the less to the left. The only countries that go communist are feudal pre-industrial peasant ones like China, Vietnam, or Russia. Meanwhile, when Germany, Japan, Spain, and the like went authoritarian, they went for fascism. Not a single Western Christian country has gone for left-wing authoritarianism. Likewise, in almost all civil wars, whether with the Bolsheviks, Jacobins, Puritans, or radical Republicans, the most radical faction eats all the others due to its greater spirit of unity. If America has anything to worry about in its future, some form of aggressive militaristic Christian fascism is probably it. All right, I'm back. I'm back, and that's, uh, that's how I see it. I think, under all circumstances, the left loses, hopefully quickly, but always lose eventually. I'm hoping the, I'm hoping the war is quick. I would like to see a left-wing uprising under a right administration that gets shut down quick and allows the right to... Uh, to put significant limits on what the left can do. That's because I'm on the right. No secret there. I like minimum casualties. The quicker we get it over, the less economic damage will be done, although I do think the currency will be destroyed. Otherwise, the next best case is a full-blown civil war with a few million people killed, Again, hopefully it ends quickly. And then, of course, the worst case is a full-blown civil war with perhaps even tens of millions killed. And then decades, literally decades and decades of terrorism in a, um, a anarcho-terrorist country where the United States looks like Afghanistan and leadership uh, changes through physical violence every five years. That could go on for a generation or two. I honestly don't think that's likely because I think the left loses very, very quickly. And that's good. Otherwise, it could be bad, but I don't know. You tell me. You put it in the comments what you think it'll be. If you have another channel or somebody that you think's done a better analysis, go ahead and link to that. There are some channels that criticize Rudyard's particular view. There's some channels that criticize Tim Poole's particular view. I don't find them very credible because everybody, nobody knows. These are just opinions. But if you want to link to that and talk about that in the comments, please go ahead. Otherwise, God bless. Like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for watching this show today. You have a fantastic weekend. Ready, stand by.